Hello and welcome to Children's Pedcast, Episode 2, a conversation about pediatrics with Children's Hospitals and Clinics of Minnesota. I'm Jimmy Bellamy, and we had Dr. Keith Cavanaugh and Karen Johnson, APRNCNP, from Children's Sleep Center in St. Paul. They were nice enough to invite me to their quarters, and it is a pretty cool space here. Um, it is across the street from Children's St. Paul in the Ritchie Medical Plaza, and they do sleep studies here, and they see patients uh, dealing with all kinds of sleep issues, sleep disorders. This episode is packed full of information when it comes to sleep habits, both good and bad, and it can help with anything from newborn babies to teenagers and everywhere in between. So great information for parents as well as kids. Fun episode, and uh, sit back and enjoy. Thank you. Hello and welcome. We're here at the Children's Sleep Center. Dr. Keith Cavanaugh, thank you for joining us. Karen Johnson, APRN, how are you? I'm good. Thank you. Dr. Kavanaugh. Thank you for having us today. Glad to be here. Um, it's a beautiful day in St. Paul. We have the sunlight reflecting in on us. It's, it's, uh, it's not a bad day in the office when you can do this. Uh, we're here to talk about one of my favorite topics, everybody's sleep. Um, I'm a big fan, and we're going to talk here about all the kinds of ha habits uh, some kids have. We're going to cover everything from newborn to teenagers, everything in between. Um, is there anything that uh, parents need to know when it comes to, uh, say, new parents, for example? You, you have a lot to worry about with, with your first child or first children. Anything that they can, can take right off the bat when, when it comes to sleeping? One of the most important things with a new parent is how different their life is now having a child in it. Their own sleep is now fractured their own problems that they had before with their own sleep is going to be magnified because now they have to look after a newborn who's in need of cares through the night. And it can be a challenge for some families when they are approached with that. If it's a single parent or two parents that are working, the idea of how they go about as a team to work with that becomes one of the things that's a hurdle they have to overcome and may not have anticipated. So parents oftentimes are confronted with issues with their baby, which may not be a problem or not, but they're perceiving them in their own sleep-deprived state. And as you know, when you don't get enough sleep, sometimes it's harder to function. Is there anything parents can do to prepare? I mean, that's it's almost become a cliche now when you talk about the loss of sleep when you're dealing with newborns and infants. Um, anything you could do to almost practice for that, or is this just a, just a, a totally different animal when it comes to, you know, having having an actual child in your care one of the problems for adults nowadays is that they don't see sleep as a priority it's something they get on the side if they can and they have to change their ways to identify the importance of it not only for themselves but for their child because when they are deprived and they can't care for their own child so it's difficult to say that there's any particular book that one can look at they can certainly talk to their family members and their parents and their friends and get insight about how life-changing it is to bring a child into this world. Because particularly when we speak to the challenges with sleep, bringing a child into this world is a sacrifice. It's a sacrifice to raise a child. Sacrifices in your own choices that you make moving forward. And you have to incorporate now that you're overseeing that care for that child. And it shows itself often because a newborn sleeps quite a bit. And the child has to be allowed to have that opportunity to sleep. Well, the sleep center here, located at the Ritchie Medical Plaza, right across from Children's St. Paul, uh, what are some of the common sleep issues that you deal with here at the sleep center? So we have a beautiful new center here that opened in the past year, and we see kids of all ages. What becomes difficult is to tease out whether or not the problem that the child has is really a problem to start with. Some kids have some behaviors when they sleep at night that are perfectly normal, but are perceived as abnormal. And so we can identify those in the clinic setting. We look for issues related to their breathing when it comes to issues with snoring and obstructive sleep apnea. 
and children who look like they struggle at night with weird behaviors, potentially raising concerns of seizures or sleep sleepwalking. But we also look at behavioral issues where parents will come in deprived of their own sleep because their child doesn't sleep, whether it be a toddler who's making the rules or the teenager who has too much technology in their room and goes to bed when they feel like they need to. Um, when it comes to, and I think about my, myself when I was a child, uh, bedtime was usually a set time. Uh, it didn't matter if it was sunny out or not. Um, it didn't matter what was going on on TV at seven or eight or nine, but occasionally there, there would be something, whether it was a family event or some, something going on outside of the home. And then very rarely there was the occasional time you did get to stay up past bedtime to maybe watch a program. Um, now that everything seems to be on demand and, and in the kids' hands, they don't necessarily have to stay up at 8 o'clock and watch something. But how, how, what's, the, what's the line as far as now, now we've, we've gotten out of this habit, this good habit, we're into a bad habit. Is, is, it, is it okay to do that once in a while? Or it, it, I guess I'm thinking if, if you're doing that, what would constitute that being a regular bad habit? Well, there so you brought up an interesting point about your perception within your own setting when you were a child growing up that is different for kids nowadays. There's this world of social media and this access to technology that brings the outside world into their home 24-7. And that's a change. When I was a child, we didn't have that type of technology present. And if I was encountering problems at school, I would leave school, come home, and that problem stayed at school. But now with this virtual playground, there's kids that are always on alert and they don't get a time to break from that. And that's a problem for some kids because they have to feel engaged with their peers and that can interfere with their abilities to get to sleep. And then you look in their bedroom environments and you think about when you were a kid, what kind of technology was there? I had a TV um, and the irony is I, I no longer have a TV in my room, nor do I want one. But there was TV stereo video game system and now with these smart pads and tablets these kids have even more it's a real issue when you put these devices in a bedroom setting because your bedroom then no longer is a place where you sleep we recognize in adults where there's issues with doing activities in bed beyond sleeping and all of a sudden they have difficulties identifying that as a place to transition to sleep and with kids if they spend times in their room with all these other devices and distractions then it's very hard for them to see them transition to sleep for reasons just beyond the fact that they're fun. You're going to tell a child to kind of dictate when they're going to go to bed. It's going to be hard because they like to do those things, but also because those things can also have some influence, particularly when it comes to light exposure with these devices, because they can be quite intense and it fools the brain. The brain recognizes a schedule of when one should sleep and when should be awake. And it's directly reflecting upon the light that it sees. And in the more natural settings where there's light present during the daytime, the expectation is at night the brain can prepare itself to go to sleep by naturally releasing melatonin in the night. Melatonin is a hormone. It's important for sleep. It's a nocturnal process that increases at that time, decreases in the daytime, but needs to be on a rhythm. And its exposure, its release is based on when it sees light. And the more consistent that is, the better it is. And the problem for a lot of kids nowadays in those environments is that they can be exposed to things and they don't feel like they're trying. It's not a time to go to sleep. It, it's funny. Uh, is that something that experts in the field thought about as uh, the advent of tablets and smartphones came about? Or is it something that was discovered after the fact that this really could be a problem? Well, it's, well been, it's been recognized that that's how we sleep based on what's known as a circadian clock that all creatures have. But the problem is that technology is becoming more advanced and accessible, that they all put these into the home settings, and it's very difficult to remove it. And as a result, there's more risk for exposure because any light after sunset is unnatural. And when one is exposed to that light, the brain is going to respond in such a way to say, it's not time to go to bed yet. 
what are some things that uh, parents can do in the home to promote that sleep readiness? Is it is it from keeping few lights on at night? Are there are there other tactics? I would say it's the, one of the most important things you can do is never let that technology get in in the first place. Don't let your child keep the smart pad in there. Don't let the child keep a television or a video game system. The bedroom, when it becomes an environment that's used for things other than sleep, can become a challenge for some kids to sleep well. So it's developing good habits early on. I hope my parents aren't listening. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> One of the um, problems though, that we have now is kids have so much homework and they have to use electronics late into the evening. So that's been, you know, tricky to try to address that because many kids are up until midnight working on their iPads to f- complete their assignments. So that's been challenging. And um, one of the things that we've done, although there is no research on this on children, but there has been research on adults who have used the blue blocker amber lens sunglasses to help them um, be able to fall asleep quicker if they do need to use electronics. And um, so we have been doing that in the sleep clinic when our teenagers need to use computers late into the night for homework. And that those glasses help block out the blue light wavelength from the electronics so that their own natural melatonin can be secreted and they can become sleepy while they still do their homework. It has to be hard, too, with not only the devices that are, I guess, necessary for a lot of this homework, but just the distractions that go with using that. Um, I mean, I can think about in my day, and it's weird to even just start a sentence with in my day, but we had the graphing calculator that was about as advanced as it got. And I think someone found a way to hack and have like this snake game on there. That was about (laughs) it. I, I couldn't imagine if I had the Internet in my hands. As a as a kid trying to do his homework, it, it would be uh, it'd be a nightmare for my family. It's asking too much for a child to try to control when they think they can and can't use it properly. So, what do you do then when when you have a kid who kind of calls the shots, for lack of a better term? That there are parents who are struggling with really putting a foot down and saying, "No, this is what we are going to do." How do you break a kid of that? Right. It's a there's an important role as a parent to set those limits. And to understand the timing that they get access to that technology. And as some people would say, your intent as a parent is not to be their friend, but to make sure you're raising them well. And oftentimes problems that come arise, can arise in a sleep clinic visit is who's making the decisions. And oftentimes we do encourage the parents to take charge of those decisions and recognize that it's sometimes it's not a happy discussion. And the kids aren't too happy with their parent because you do it. But when you show them the evidence and you look at the presence of such technology in the bedroom, it makes uh, it's really a no brainer. I mean, we know that there's an increased risk for obesity. There's an increased risk for difficulties functioning in school. There's an increased risk for depression and mood disorders. I mean, we know that athletes have more difficulties if they're not getting an adequate quantity of sleep. And Speaking to the issues of homework, you can also look at the current approach to sports in our country and the push we see for young kids being kept up fairly late for their activities, expecting them to then function well in school the next day. It's a real concern. I have a teenager, and when she was in 11th and 12th grade, I took her phone at night, and it got plugged in in my room. And that's what I recommend to the parents that I see, too, because they need to manage those electronics. Kids just, they don't, they're not going to manage it. They're going to keep texting and social networking into the night. Yeah, keep that technology out. That's a that's great advice. And if they can do that for all their kids and for themselves, that's really hard. You have to show by example that you can do these things. Because if you're not doing it as a parent, then it's going to be hard for your child to do it. Of course, during the appointment, you know, the teenagers give you the stink eye. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You, you, do you ever do you ever go in there and just play good cop, bad cop with them? <laughs> well, ultimately, it's still the child you're trying to embrace them so they'll want to do that. When we talk to adolescents about their goals in life, that becomes critical. Because if they can see sleep as an important factor with that, that gets them to achieve their goals. You know, it's amazing, like, the age 
group that can manipulate cell phones. I mean, we see like two year olds going to their parents first during the appointment and just, you know, managing that cell phone like they know what they're doing. Yeah, and it starts early. It is quite amazing how early on in in a child's life they can pick up on that with the touch screen. Um, One thing we know through a lot of research is how important birth to age three is with the development for lifelong habits. Can the same be said for sleep habits carrying into adulthood? Yes. The idea that a child will just outgrow a sleep problem is usually not the case. And that's a a problem based on what the issue may be. There's certain things we observe and we watch them as they're doing as they get older. But some things, if they learn bad habits early on, then it's going to be a problem later on. You know, if anybody plays sports and they learn bad technique with things and you apply that technique moving forward, you can see problems as they get older. Talk to me about uh, sleep apnea because this is something that when you think of sleep apnea, I think some, I I don't want to speak for everybody, but I think... A lot of people would think the way I do where you picture, you know, an overweight middle-aged guy, um, you know, maybe suffered a broken nose a few times as well. But sleep apnea in children, is this, is this something that is new to a lot of people as far as not just thinking their kid is being a pain uh, when, when not going to sleep or not being able to sleep? It's not a new problem. It's just getting more attention and people recognize it as something they have to look at. Look at. We estimate about 3% of kids have problems with obstructive sleep apnea, but that's based on various studies. And sometimes when you take into account obesity and how that influences it now in our country, these numbers are even higher. We don't necessarily have to see a child who's markedly obese to presume that's the child who has obstructive sleep apnea. Size may not predict that. And the children aren't small adults. The severity of disease that we see on kids with obstructive sleep apnea is can be um, not as we've seen adult. It's it's not as severe in the frequency of these events and see what we describe as the consequences. And studies looking at kids who have obstructive sleep apnea draw attention to the impact that has on what we call neurocognitive development. And studies have shown these kids with obstructive sleep apnea can be at risk for lower IQs. And we may not see that as a complaint that comes to clinic. They don't come saying my kid's not having, but they may talk about struggling in school. And that's something that may be related to the quality of their sleep. My guess would be that there are kids going through this right now that never make it far enough to get here. What would you say to a parent who is experiencing uh, maybe kids who are lethargic or having problems, whether it be behavioral or with their studies to say, come in here, we we can help, or for anybody listening uh, around the world. I think an important point with children and sleep deprivation or poor quality sleep is that they don't always get sleepy. You and I have a bad night's sleep as an adult. We more likely are going to take a nap or sleep more the next day. Children tend to become hyperactive. When you look at a child who doesn't get enough sleep, they really struggle in the management of impulse and mood. And these are things that, as they get older, develop with brain development, are able to control those things. But when they're younger, when a parent is perceiving their child as not functioning well in the daytime, then you have to say, what's going on with their sleep? And then it's twofold. It's very helpful to look at the quantity of sleep a child gets. So the idea of what time they go to bed, what time they wake up. The National Sleep Foundation came out recently with some new guidelines that talked about what we hope to see a children gets in quantity of sleep. There's Parents will ask us in clinic, what's the right amount of sleep their child should get? It should be the right amount that they function well. Some need more, some need less. We shoot for what we consider our, our guidelines and goals there, but Some kids may function with a need for more sleep, and if they're not getting it, they're deprived. And in the face of that deprivation, then they have issues with potential behavior and functioning well. And on the other side of that is the quality of that sleep, and that's where we draw attention to snoring and restlessness and looks like they stopped breathing or gasping for air or waking up and felt like they didn't sleep very well. 
Um, again, the American Academy of Pediatrics puts out guidelines looking at these things. And if a child is snoring more than three nights a week and you have concerns about learning problems or attention deficit concerns or sleepiness, then there is an interest to look closer at that. And there can be a role for a sleep study to potentially define if there's a problem or not. Um, how about the dynamic of kids sharing rooms? Um, is, are there any are there any differences as opposed to a child who has his or her own room? Um, do you see a tendency for uh, one to sleep well and not the other, or both not to sleep well? Well, it's unique to the child's and their temperament. The a family that has the luxury to have a child can have their own room can work to de- deal with those issues. When a child has to share a room with a uh, another child, then you have to look to, as them as individuals and make sure that they're not disruptive. You can develop good habits for both, and sometimes they see how the other child does and they can mimic that behavior and they can see some improvement. But there are times when we look to, say, the sleep space, where they're sleeping becomes an issue. You know, we talk about babies and there's this language of co-sleeping. And we talk about there's a difference between when we talk about bed sharing and a child who's in the same room, so co-sleeping in the same space. And we recommend that they sleep in separate surfaces for protection, particularly for the little ones, but also to give that opportunity for better sleep. So it's a critical issue in the younger children. We talk about concerns related to sudden infant death syndrome. And as they get older, um, some kids, particularly infants and toddlers, can become attached to the parent as a security object. And then they hold that as their way that they transition to sleep. And if they don't identify something else, and not every kid takes to a transitional object, but if they don't identify something else, then the parent becomes that object which they seek out at night. And it can be very disruptive with their sleep. That's why it's always better to go with the stuffed animal or the blanket, I assume. Or even a T-shirt that the parent wears. We talk about knotting those things up or something that has scent to them or texture to it. And that can be a powerful thing for a child that gives them comfort so they can get to sleep on their own because ultimately we want them to learn to fall asleep on their own it's normal to wake up at night i think we need to recognize as as a species we've evolved over a long time that the thought about why we wake briefly at night might be because we're at risk when we're asleep i mean long ago we might have been eaten and the sense of assessing threat and going back to sleep and as as a normal process but infants newborns toddlers, they may wake up and say, how do I go to sleep? Where, where is my mom? Where's my dad? How do I do that? So if a parent is very attached, as you go back to that question earlier about how does a new parent approach a child so they can help them sleep better, is starting to give them the skills around six months of age where you put them down sleepy, but not asleep on you. And so at that point, that separation allows for the child to learn how to sleep on their own. And as they get older, or have a, a roommate or another, a sibling who shares a room with them, the hope is they mimic that behavior too and then recognize that that's, the time, that's how we go to sleep. These frequent night awakenings, they are the, one of the common problems with behavioral insomnia, with the inability to be a self-soother where you need your mom and dad because that will have to recreate itself in the middle of the night during a natural awakening or a frequent awakening, the mom will have to come back or the dad and provide what they had to do at bedtime to get the child back to sleep. We do a lot of behavioral insomnia here. I work with um, these families a lot. That's probably one of my top patients I work with, teaching them how to self-soothe their child through a sleep training program. Okay. Um, you you have uh, written about daylight saving time before, and a, a lot of what you've said, Dr. Kavanaugh, has to do with kind of that preparation for sleep that it really it doesn't start with go to bed it, it's setting the stage for that Karen talk about what that what what kind of things you should do for daylight saving time both when it comes uh, to moving up in the spring and falling back in the fall well it's a good idea to get your child to bed a little earlier the week leading up to the time change which will be March 8th So four days before daylight savings time, which takes place at 2 in the morning, you want to get your child to bed 15 minutes earlier than they usually go to sleep the first night. You want to make your child's bedtime progressively earlier by 15 minutes each of the four nights leading up to daylight savings time. 
So this will add up to an hour in the time change. And as we spring ahead, um, March 8th, your child will be prepared to fall asleep with the time change. When it comes to the light and the dark, um, should parents do a better job to darken the room come springtime when it's going to be light out longer? Well, that is a very good point you bring up. Dark has a lot to do with um, promoting sleep in the evening. So it's a good idea to get the lights dim in the household 30 to 60 minutes before bedtime and have the child's bedroom be fairly dark. If you do use a night light, make it very dim. Uh, sometimes we even do rec- uh, recommend using a red or an amber night light because this can be influential in uh, having the melatonin be secreted at bedtime, which the child needs the melatonin to become sleepy. Light and dark influence our sleep and our wake cycles. So dark in the evening is very important during this time. And light in the morning when the child wakes can be beneficial in helping the child wake easier and quicker and become alert. That's something we really stress when they wake up in the morning is to make sure they're getting a lot of bright light. It's easy in Minnesota summers to find that light. It's harder, obviously, in the winter time, And so we encourage any approach with more light. Um, obviously, teenagers sometimes put themselves in caves. You might have when you were younger. And the idea of what type of shades are on the windows, there are some fairly affordable darkening shades you can find out in some of the big box stores, which is helpful. And that can make a big difference in an environment. You know, we're a little more flexible in the summertime, recognizing that kids tend to keep their routines off. But in, in reality, it still doesn't serve the child well to be getting to bed so late. And particularly when we fall back or spring forward, that internal clock, that sense of when you feel sleepy is shifted and it's very hard. So the, what Karen's describing is this gradual approach where if you can be focused on it and pay attention to the fact that's four days from now a thought process then you can begin to gradually have the child go to bed earlier and not whether they protest or not oftentimes the child will follow the rules if you have a good routine for bed a simple routine for bed that they recognize has a beginning middle and end and if it's more drawn out it can be more stressful for the child but daylight savings times really makes a lot of kids really cause a lot of trouble particularly with teenagers you know or kids in school uh, for parents when they're trying to function with their with their own workload. You were talking about uh, toddlers having, well, I guess you were talking about infants at the time, talking about having that, that that's something to cling to, to, to kind of trigger the sleep. But uh, I'm, I'm thinking about toddlers who really are a pain, <laughs> for lack of a better term, when, when they protest that, no, I'm not going to bed. What can you do? What can you do as a parent when you're trying to set a specific time for bed, but it, it, it's a war every night that you're dreading? We talk about limit setting, and those problems just didn't show up. And no parent wants their child all of a sudden to be having these type of problems. But unfortunately, that can be a production that evolves over time. So it goes back to their time as an infant before they were that t- troubling toddler. That you're trying to incorporate better habits so that they recognize that the the simpler the bedtime routine, the better. I mean, love your child as much as you want. Read as many books as you want after dinner. But when you incorporate it into the bedtime, that can be a problem. And we talk to parents in clinic, and they start laughing at themselves about how extensive or how many songs they sing or they dance with their child or they cuddle up with them. And it's like, what time does the next production begin? Because you must be exhausted after doing all that. They're on survival mode. And they will do whatever they can, and the the child is in charge. So when... Mm -hmm. Those type of things come up, it becomes really critical about setting limits in that the parent starts to set the time when bedtime and wake time are and limiting kind of access to certain things so that it's a calm down period. When we see kids that protest, it does become what their temperament is dealing with. We, we often make sure that there's nothing physiologically there going on. We pay attention in the sleep center with issues related to constipation or asthma or any history of ear infections or eczema, rash, things that can be disruptive to one's sleep quality or restless interfering legs, with that. Motor restlessness. Rest, this motor restlessness we talk about where the child can have a weird feeling in their legs that, that is hard to describe, which we see in adults. And it's a condition that oftentimes can be terribly debilitating for an adult and yet doesn't get as much attention. But if you ask that adult, when did this start happening for you? They may recall it when they were 12 or younger. 
But it, when you ask the parent or this adult to describe it, it's very difficult. So there's things that can happen, can be disrupted to that. But then the toddler is really setting the rules. It is returning that parent to saying, okay, this is how we're going to approach this. And oftentimes, whatever you did with that child, the next week is going to be very hard because behavioral issues for children get worse before they get better. They have to be patient and recognize that any change is going to be not well received. And as a result, the parent can break down and feel like, okay, I tried that. That didn't work. When in reality, there is an approach where we look at the opportunity for that child to sleep better. We look at children who come out of the rooms that sometimes have that difficulties with attachment and they want to be near their parent where we recognize there's times where the child comes into the room and it's just easier for the parent to let them climb into bed with them because they're exhausted and they got to be at work in the morning. And if they're in bed with me, they sleep. Fair enough. There are times where that happens and I can recognize that. But ultimately, as we talk in clinic about kind of a mountain standing there to climb, eventually one day you're going to want to start climbing that mountain to take tackle that problem. And when you do, um, there are times where we'll have the parent actually present in the child's room. And whether they bring a cot in there or some type of space, the parent can begin the battle in that child's room. And then what we describe is a graduated removal from that. And there's many different ways. You can read many sleep help books about this. The idea is still that the intent is to not do cold turkey or the ability to just get out of there, but is to be more gradual about it. And when you do that, there's the opportunity for that child to see that separation in a way that's not received as a, a increasing fear or anxiety. And they can learn that skill set to fall asleep on their own. And then we look at reward systems. We find ways that a child will want. There are things that kids want. And taking advantage of that and exploiting that is okay. Because you can teach a child better habits and reward them for good behaviors rather than punishing them for bad behaviors. And there's different tools that we use for that not only with sticker charts, um, stoplights where we put their names in the green light and move them up when they're doing poorly or making bad choices, to even some what we call behavioral nightlights that we know that are out there. There's many on the market, but they can be visual cues for a child to say, this is when I go to bed and this is when I wake up. And it can be helpful for the parent, sometimes with charting on the wall to say these are the things we do, but to find these tools that can help a child then develop their own habits to stay in their room. But they're never easy. And there are many different books that they read with different strategies. And the sleep help book can be confusing with that. But ultimately, the parents have to have the fortitude to work through that because it's difficult. And finally, particularly in a, in a home with two parents, it's stressful. I mean, parents don't come to our sleep center talking about their own problems, but we know that kids who have sleep problems can cause a tremendous amount of stress on a marriage. And when that presents, that can cause difficulties. And kids feed off that stress. And, and it, often we see kids who are with mom during the week and dad on the weekend, and there's a whole different set of bedtime rules at each place. So that, that complicates things even more. Which reinforces the idea of having the same routine in every night of the week at the same bedtime, the same wake time, a simple bedtime approach and getting people to understand that. And you're right. When there's a separation and the children are in two homes, these are the conflicts that we encounter that in a realistic world, we work our best to get the parents to buy into that, to understand that in the better for their child's sleep, they'll do better. And so if we see kids with behavioral issues, we address that in such fashion. But that's not to say that the importance of uh, that my child, if he could sleep better, then better, he could behave better. That's true. But we also reinforce the idea that if my child behaved better, they could sleep better. It's a two-way street. And it's not... Uh, it should not be slighted that that's something that needs to be explored at the same time. That's not to say a child has a mental health problem, but they need to learn how to cope and process things. And dealing with toddlers is not easy. All month long in March, we will be highlighting sleep um, as part of our highlights of neurology. Um, we will have a ton of content throughout our social media channels, and you can find it at childrensmn.org. Uh, as part of our mighty blog, one of the great points that I saw come up that I never would have thought of is, as you said, you want 
the preparation for sleep to be calming. Um, and a lot of people's routines involves bathing the child before bed or near before bed. And um, one of the greatest tips I saw in, in the snooze letter that the sleep center put out was if that is a stimulating event for a child, maybe move it to the morning or do it earlier in the evening or later in the afternoon. Yeah. There's again, comes back to the child's temperament because we have rhythms and routines and some parents would tell you that's a calming thing we do. And others may not identify that as the case. Kids who have sensory integration issues may have problems with certain approaches with this. And I agree that if you can get a child into a routine that is more calming, that is going to help them transition to sleep. And that's an important thing that the parents have to look within their own home and the environment they're in and reinforce that and be consistent with that because children rely on that degree of consistency. Kids need structure at bedtime a regular routine, and even for the toddlers or preschoolers using that picture board, which helps them see like pictures in preparation for bedtime. By the time they get to their last picture, they see their bed and their brain is cued. It's time for sleep. That's a good idea for that age group. And any parent who's had a child in daycare will go pick them up during nap time and is just surprised to see 30 cots in a room with everybody asleep and wondering, how do they do that? Because the kids are doing their routines, and it's that rhythm and that expectation and understanding of what they're doing. And so when we talk to parents about sleep quantity and recognizing, like, naps, how often does a child nap? So, you know, an infant into the first year of life, a child may take a couple naps. Um, As they get older, they start phasing those out. But in the daycare setting, they may have a consistent nap at 1230 or 1 o'clock in the afternoon, But on weekends, the parents may not put them down for a nap because they got other kids doing activities or it's just not seen as a priority. And that child is deprived of that sleep quantity we talk about where we hope to see them getting a particular amount of sleep. And if they uh, recognize the importance of those naps as part of the rhythm, that can be important. And when you talked about toddlers and their routines, that's an excellent time to start incorporating a simple bedtime routine, even though it's at nap time, so they understand what you're doing, and you can incorporate that in, at, in the evening. One thing that I wanted to say is that lots of times parents come into the sleep center for their appointment, and they pretty much know what the problem is and what caused it, but they have really no idea how to fix it. So that's where we just meet with them and develop like a customized sleep plan that will meet their needs and their schedules to make this most successful so their child can get better sleep the child sleeping well, then everyone's sleeping well in the house, hopefully. I always try to target, and of course this is as an adult, although some would argue I'm not an adult, um, I try to target eight hours a night. And I feel if I can get eight, great. If I can get near it, we're, we're winning the battle. But when teenagers are dealing with not only technology, as we've mentioned, but as you mentioned as well, athletics, um, academics, and you put all that together, sometimes jobs, jobs, sometimes you wonder how is it even possible for them to get eight hours a night? What kind of, what kind of pitfalls are they dealing with? They don't get that sleep. Uh, A very large study just recently released in the journal pediatrics looked at almost 20 years, 300,000 kids they surveyed about their sleep habits, and the, and over half of them weren't getting more than seven hours. It was a, a tremendous number that recognized the challenges for these kids to function well, and they're not going to be the ones to perceive this. When you go to the National Sleep Foundation, they do regular surveys of the community. If you ask a child, do you get enough sleep? They may say yes, because what they perceive as adequate is good to them. If you ask the parent, does your child have a sleep problem? No, they don't seem to have an issue. But when you actually get the data for how much sleep they're getting, it's not enough. And as a result, those kids go along chronically deprived, and it's very difficult then to function. Because, again, you may work on eight hours, but there are kids out there who believe they go by on seven hours. But the kids who we see in clinic are the ones who are struggling. We're not seeing the kids who get seven hours and are striving and doing really well. They're, they're, those don't, kids don't necessarily come out of the woodwork, but our ultimate goal is to make sure that the kids who are um, achieving the, at least an opportunity to get that sleep are set up for success. Um, do you ever run into having to help people maybe take that that inventory of 
the daily routine or the daily activities and, and do any of them ever come to something come to a realization that they have to drop something or get get rid of something? Well, they certainly make it a priority if they can, and some people will make adjustments of when they do things. I think it's uh, really hard in an era with kids and sports, but at what age they do these things and what time they do them. There's a interesting conversation going on about what, what time these kids should be playing these sports and is there an impact on their abilities to function. There's a huge issue with school start times, the idea of adolescents starting school so early when we know that naturally they're sleepy later. And as a result, they don't get the opportunity to get sleep because we've imposed upon them a schedule that doesn't work well. So while the child may be trying to cut back things, ultimately as adults, we should be making changes to give the kids the opportunities to change that. And there's been an effort. The Academy of Pediatrics put out uh, a guide and a policy with recommendations of changing the school start time for high schoolers to past 830 and that's not typically seen in most settings. There's a few school districts who have national recognition here in Minnesota because they did make a change in their school start times. And one superintendent of one of these school districts pointed out that it's in 40 years of educating children, it was the most important thing he ever did for the benefit of children and learning. How how about the change, and I keep going back to technology, but we are expected in so many avenues of life now to be able to do more in a shorter amount of time. Um, you, you did touch on it earlier about kids are coming in dealing with these things where you used to be able to separate school from home, and, and now it's all connected, and you said they have to be, they're on alert constantly. Has that changed the approach to sleep care? Well, we know that we're not going to make this technology go away. I'm a realist, but we can try to manipulate when they use it or how we are exposed to it. As Karen talks about with this intense light that comes from these devices and the blue light of particular interest can be filtered out with an orange lens, there's benefit with that. It may look silly, but if it can help fool the brain so the child will feel sleepy earlier, that allows them to do their homework on their tablets and then be able to hopefully transition to sleep earlier and that's the ultimate goal but it does present the difficulties how about how about i want to talk about obstructive sleep apnea in teens especially um walk me through that so approach on a little bit so obstructive sleep apnea we speak about when a child is snoring they may actually struggle to move air into their lungs and as a result that might have an impact not only on how much oxygen they get but also importantly, does that disturb the brain and its restfulness? And the challenges that a child can experience with that is they will awaken and the night wasn't restful. It was like running a marathon all night. And when they're deprived of that sleep, they have difficulties functioning well. When they're younger, um, in the as, as school-aged children, oftentimes there's a question that comes up about their tonsils as a potential factor that's there. And there are recent studies that look at whether or not is that the, do they, do they, is that the focus. Now, typically the tonsils are the number one reason for issues with breathing when it comes to sleep apnea. But we're learning more about what is the best approach to manage that. And it may not necessarily be that one needs to have those tonsils removed. But it's challenging to create studies that involve multiple centers to look at these things in point of a clear-cut, concise way. So we're left with our experiences and the hope to say that kids will do better. But certainly we recommend a tonsillectomy for a child who's snoring and has daytime behavioral issues. And those are things that um, sometimes need to be teased out in the sleep lab settings, but sometimes they're just really black and white based on what they find on exam. When they're older, Obesity starts to become a factor. Now, granted, it's sad to say that it's, that's also an issue with school-age kids and younger, but we pay attention to these factors when it comes to how they function. The, uh, the young adults who have issues um, with obstructive sleep apnea, those issues may go beyond tonsillectomies, adenoidectomies, the removal of these. And then we start having open discussions about other approaches to manage obstructive sleep apnea which includes certain medicines. I would prefer to have a child on no medicine, but there are a, there's a role for certain medicines like nose sprays and other things. 
but there's also CPAP, which is a device that helps to open the airway up. And it's not uncommon in clinic to see kids who may have a need. And one of the parents has had personal experience with that. It's genetic. And there's a factor there where they may or may not have seen their parent using one of these things. And just like the parent probably struggled with the first time it was introduced, the child may not be excited to see that in their lives. And they may know they have a problem and not want to come talk about it. But as a result, we want to get them into clinic, raise a discussion about what they see themselves doing in their lives, kind of focus on their goals and how we can help them succeed and not look at the night to night and the struggles about, I don't want to wear that or not. Because we do have a tremendous amount of success for kids who can wear those things if they understand the why as to what our goals are at the right age. And if they don't feel that's a helpful thing or they don't want to pursue that, when they're older, there's other devices like oral appliances um, that do come into the equation that we look at for approaches to, to help a child breathe as best possible. But sometimes it does require a, a visit to the sleep lab to sort those things out. And what's the what's the best way for people to reach you if they are interested in, in coming to the sleep center for a number of issues? Right. So through the website that you mentioned uh, to contact us, they can find the links there and, and make appointments if necessary. There are uh, important thing they can discuss this with their doctors, their pediatricians, their family practice doctors, their ENT doctors. Um, we don't always need to see every patient who comes into our center. There are kids who come for sleep studies who we collect enough data on them that if I feel it's in their better interest to come back to see us in the sleep center, I will recommend that. But we're able to gauge if there's a problem or not, which can benefit the pediatrician and the community if they're trying to answer that question, particularly in a child who's struggling in school or is obese or has ADHD-like symptoms and has findings on exam that would raise suspicions of sleep-disordered breathing, whether they be obese or have enlarged tonsils. But recognizing that a child who is slender and does not have large tonsils does not necessarily rule out obstructive sleep apnea. When I was a kid, grew up in a house, mom and dad, four boys, and of course we were we did not have the luxury of having our own rooms. Um, uh, the room I shared with my brother, that that brother, I won't say his name because I don't want to embarrass him, but he he would frequently have sleep terrors, and this was something where uh, we would as as a household, for the most of us would be downstairs because. He he was the youngest one. Well, I kind of gave him away there. He was the youngest one, and he would he would be the only one sleeping. And he'd come downstairs in a panic about something, uh, whether it was he forgot to get the Super Bowl tickets or you name it. And he would be in this all out panic. And we would we would try to calm him down, but nothing seemed to work. Um, what what are the best things to do for things like that? So, well, to defend your brother's good name, I would tell you that he's normal. <laughs> so, He'll be happy to hear that. Yes, you should interest, have videotaped him. <laughs> the challenges that parents often see when they're confronted with what you're describing are known as parasomnias, and these are unusual behaviors that occur at night that can be that can be normal, and it can be scary to the parents. So, many a person is familiar with a sleepwalker. Uh, some have experience with sleep terrors. And then we talk about that as a spectrum. We're in the middle of that is what's known as confusional arousals. And there is really, it's not entirely clear why they occur, but the, the best description, as I recall back in my training days, was when we sleep, we go through these different stages of sleep, whether we're very light sleep or deep sleep or REM sleep. Uh, we shift through these through the night. The brain is extremely active at night. We look like we're resting, but the brain has a lot of house cleaning to do. And as a result, with shifting through these stages of sleep, there are certain times where it may not be so smooth. And anyone who's driven a stick shift and didn't do it well might grind gears when they move through those shifts. And that brings out this, what we call this fight or flight, this sympathetic release. And a child can look quite distressed when these things occur. What's helpful for parents when they see these events is to determine is that a parasomnia or is the child having a nightmare? And a simple question to ask themselves is, in the morning after the events happen, who's more scared at the breakfast table? If the child is terrified, that gives you a sense it was a nightmare. If the parent is terrified and the child has no recall, that's likely a parasomnia. 
And typically, the kids can outgrow those without much intervention. We stress that they're getting an adequate quantity of sleep. We stress that they're going to bed um, and getting the same bedtime, wake time as we talked about. We look for any things like sleep disordered breathing or snoring or things we might want to treat. But ultimately, these things do well on their own. And there are the rare occasions where a child is trying to leave the house or turning on the stove where we have to intervene because the parent isn't sleeping because certain things are going on pending the severity of the episodes. And we see a role for medications in those occasions. But it's typically be able to manage that without that. Well, you guys have been generous with your time. We're about an hour in here. Before we go home, is there anything else you think we should touch on that, that parents need to know? Um, and even, even if there's kids listening, what kind of tips for myriad sleep sleep disorders you'd like to touch on? Well, I can't stress enough about our challenges with technology. If there's one thing that I hope the parents would is to walk into their child's room and look around it and see what's there. What's a distraction? And if you have the luxury to remove it, then you do because it doesn't help to have that environment as a place that is something used for beyond sleep. And particularly if you feel your child is not sleeping as well as they could be, then it becomes even more important to take the onus to take on that challenge and see that as important for your child's health. All right. Well, Karen, anything to add? I think what's really important to, um, to all teenagers, if they have the motivation to make their sleep better, is to, um, if you're going to stay up late, just tell yourself that you're not going to be able to sleep in late the next day. Because... Um, Teenagers often have a different sleep schedule from weekday to weekends. They tend to do catch-up sleep on the weekends, sleeping late into the afternoon. And this really disrupts their circadian rhythm. So it's kind of like from weekend to weekday, they have jet lag starting out every Monday morning being really tired. So typically we recommend that they don't sleep in more than one to two hours later than their regular weekday wake time to help maintain their circadian rhythm and get to bright light in the morning. The sunlight is the brightest source and the most influential and uh, alerting you. However, we have uh, often recommended artificial light in the form of a light box too. So um, I would just say teens don't sleep in too late. You're not going to feel good Monday morning. And I have to finally say too to those young parents with those younger kids is to develop good habits. And think about when you had a new baby how the priority was get that kid his sleep, get her sleep. We got to go home. We got to take a nap. You guys want to go out tonight? No, we got to get home because we got to get our child to sleep. And as they get older in their toddler years and their school age years, that should still remain a priority because we know kids that don't get that quantity of sleep can have consequences. And it's important that parents are charged to make those changes for their kids and, 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 be advocates for their well-being because as i will tell a parent it's like skipping you know if you eat three meals a day and you skip one meal a day that's not really that healthy and some people should see lacking sleep as skipping a meal well you guys can find us at childrensmn.org we're also on twitter at childrensmn and we're on facebook like the rest of the world you can find us children's hospitals and clinics